uh, Cassie Anderson. She is the agriculture and horticulture agent in Adams County. She has a wealth of knowledge, um, especially when it comes to vegetable gardening. And she has a great presentations for you all on uh, vegetable varieties. So take it away, Cassie. All right. Yes. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm going to open up the chat really briefly. Um, I want to hear from you guys uh, what vegetables you most like to grow. That way I know where I might change my emphasis a little bit or focus a little bit more. I know you all love tomatoes and I've got a, lot, a nice long section on tomatoes, but we've got plenty of other vegetable varieties that do great here in Colorado, especially here along the Front Range. So uh, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, salads, Ooh, beets, nice. Uh, I'm not gonna be, have time to talk about herbs today, but glad you're into herbs. Radishes, celery, cucumbers, excellent. Eggplant, cool. Beans, peppers, new to gardening, trying to figure out what grows, great. I've got a wonderful list for you to start. Artichokes, ooh, I'd love to do those. I never have tried. Whole beans, winter squash, love it, love it. Okra, I don't have any section on okra. Sometimes it can be a little tricky here. Uh, zucchini and cucumber, we'll definitely cover those. We'll definitely cover broccoli. I did take corn out. I can explain why really briefly. Uh, corn is hard to get good yields in, um, in backyard situations for numerous reasons. And there's a lot of neighborhood pests like raccoons that really like to decimate their populations. So not one I will be talking about. Oh, someone just got their dirt and they're gonna plant some cucumbers. I love it. Okay. And yes, I will be talking about, um, for each category of, of vegetable, I will give you some recommendations of particular types that do well here. Um, there's also a great resource, All America Selection, uh, is a program that tests and examines plants of all types, but have, they have a subcategory for vegetables. And very generally speaking, if a plant does well in all America selection, it will do well in your garden as well. So it's a good place to kind of start and search as a place to start, a place to look if you want to find some really good, reliable varieties. All right, so we'll close up the chat. And if you have questions from here on out, if you can put those into the Q&A, Meryl and Lisa will answer those for you. But I'm gonna get started with one of my very favorite crops. Uh, we're pretty much just going in alphabetical here. I'm going to start with some beans. Beans are a plant that do really well here in Colorado. They like our soils. They are fairly tolerant of a wide variety of soils, so you can you can have pretty good luck with them. They do, however, not really like to have very salty situations. So if you have salty water or high salts in your soil, you might see uh, necrotic areas around the edges, kind of like in this top right picture. Um, and you might need to rethink how you're planting them, how you're watering them, that kind of thing. You can work with your local county extension office to kind of figure out a plan if that's the case. They do like soil to be well drained. They are a fairly light feeder. They're, um, they are a legume, which means that they are able to fix their own nitrogen from the soil or from the air. Um, and they are therefore have lower nitrogen needs, but they do still like to have a fairly high organic material in the soil. When you're thinking about planting them, you do want to wait until soils are quite warm. Um, this is gonna be a theme you'll hear throughout this talk that warm soil temperature or soil temperatures are really important when you're thinking about how you're planting. Uh, if you have a thermometer or if you have a kitchen thermometer that's getting a bit old and you don't mind sacrificing it, then you can definitely put that in at least six inches deep, usually in the morning, Oh, that's right. Um, this should say 60 degrees, not 600. Um, my degree signs didn't change over when I was doing some updates. Um, so yeah. Um, and for, so for taking the soil temperature, put it in six inches deep in the morning when the soils will be at their coolest and that will give you a good reading of when you can start planting. Beans really like the soil to be over 60 degrees for planting. They, they won't like to germinate very well before that. And it's important with beans not to crowd them. Um, it can be tempting to put them to get, really snug them together, but for, for the purpose of getting higher yields, giving them the space that the packet has, told, has stated is really important. All right, into some varieties. There are some beans that don't grow well here, but we also have plenty that do. So I'm focusing on those. Um, you wanna 
if you can, if you read bean descriptions, you can look for ones that tolerate fairly high heat. Um, and if you're looking for fresh green beans, um, kind of that just standard fresh cooked green bean, Vortex is a lovely one that's long and stringless, um, a very dark green color. What, two of my very favorites are Jade and Blue Lake. They're both very reliable, very consistent. You can get them both as a pole bean and as a bush bean. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and Muscat is another very productive, tender pod, a little bit of a lighter green. Um, for, that is an All America Selection variety. So when it is All America Selection, I've been I've tried to put it into parentheses with that AAS to kind of signal you. If you want to go a little bit more variety, if you want some color in um, in your garden, there's purple and yellow be beans that do very well here. Royal Burgundy is a purple one, does not have any strings. It usually comes as a bush bean. Indie Gold is a wax bean that has nice green tips. Um, Cheyenne Yellow and Roque d'Or are both, all, both also yellow and very lovely beans. When you're growing your beans and you're thinking about man managing them, um, you do want to think about your pot. The, um, you want to be very careful and conscious how you're managing them. When you're harvesting them, you want to look at the pod diameter, not necessarily the length to determine when they're ready. Usually when they start to look kind of like a pencil, fairly round, this one in this picture is actually on the verge of being a little too mature. You can see how it's swelling, those pot, those beans inside are swelling. You can kind of see some dents in between them. Usually you want to get them a little bit smoother than that, but of course it can, it can vary depending on the variety as well. It's also a really good idea. I love this person is using a knife to cut the beans off. It's very tempting to pull them off, but you can then damage the plant and potentially damage future heart for future crops. Make sure that you keep pull your harvested pods out, bring them inside as soon as possible after harvest and store in the refrigerator. We also grow really great dry beans in Colorado. Um, taste is going to be really a lot much better than the ones that you buy at the grocery store. So there's some good choices here. Anasazi are more of the white brown. You've even seen these in the grocery store for purchase, but if you're growing them yourself, it's definitely a great choice. The Sonoran Gold Tapery Bean is a small gold, kind of sweet. Um, one of my favorite dry beans I eat, both as dry and as fresh, is black cocoa. Um, it kind of has a buttery texture and a little bit of a fuzz on the, the outside of the, the bean when it's fresh, but it makes it makes very large, very tasty, earthy um, black beans if you're growing them to dry. If you are growing dry beans, they are particularly important for making sure you're following the spacing guidelines when you're planting them. Okay, coal crops. And this is normally a two hour talk and I've cut it down to make sure we can get in in our hour. So forgive me if, I feel, if you feel like we're kind of rushing through, but I'll try and, um, get at least get through all of our crops for you today. Uh, coal crops are pretty much any members of the cruciferous family, mustards, um, the broccolis, kale, cabbage, bro um, Brussels sprouts, all of those are all in the coal crop category. And these are all cool season crops. They like to grow when the soils and the air temperatures are cooler. Some of them will grow a little bit more into the growing season before you get a crop or into the heat of the summer before you get a crop, but they're all identified by the same need for grow growing quickly and very easily. Uh, if you don't water, water or fertilize quite enough, then you're likely to get off flavors, which you can't rectify even if you ramp back up on your watering. They do need a well-drained rich soil. This will help you with that rapid growth. And they do need fairly regular fertilization, at least for, to get them started and get them growing well. So you want to give them nitrogen when you transplant them and nitrogen at about around three, weeks three and five after transplanting. Yes, coal crops could be planted now. Um, they are a good choice for the, the April kind of, the April season of, of growing. They do benefit because they have shallow roots and they're not very good competitors. They do benefit from mulching once you've got them in as transplants. When you're thinking about varieties, um, broccoli are going to be a very good choice. Uh, 
you can always get, you can start them inside yourself or you can buy transplants and go either way, but you do want to transplant them when they're fairly small. Um, just a couple of leaves, no more than about four inches tall. You can try Arcadia or Umqua. The nice thing about these two is that they have side shoot production. So once you cut off that top crown that's very large, they, they, it will continue to produce small side shoots that you can harvest sometimes for a couple months after that initial crown has gone. Um, Gypsy is a standard. If you wanna go for something that's really fun and beautiful, Purple Peacock has that purple and green color. Uh, so a little bit more anthocyanin, which if you're worried about, or if you're interested in really upping your, your healthy foods. When you're thinking about harvesting your broccoli, there's a few things to look for. You wanna make sure that your heads are dark green, um, fairly compact and closed. You don't want any yellow florets. In this picture, this one is actually just on the cusp of being right past its prime, I would say, um, but it could be the variety as well. It's hard to say. You want them to be fairly compact. You wanna cut them with a knife or with scissors instead of trying to tear them off. It's a fairly large stem, as you know from purchasing um, broccoli from the grocery store, but once you've, once you've harvested it, you wanna rapidly cool it, get it inside into the fridge so you don't lose any, good, any of your good nutrients or flavor profile. Cauliflower is going to be another really good choice here in Colorado. Um, the big important thing to think about when you're growing cauliflower here, another good one that we could get transplanting in the next week or two, um, is that you wanna really protect it from the sun. So it's fairly easy to do. Cauliflower plants have these lovely green, large green leaves that are large enough to cover that entire space. If you're growing a green one like this Romanesco type, you're not going, you're not as likely to need to because the reason you're covering is to prevent those white curds from photosynthesizing, from becoming green. And when the, when the cauliflower is already green, it's not really as big of an issue. So it's kind of nice in that sense. Um, but you can definitely tent it up. I've seen people use paper clips or binder clips. I've seen people use rubber bands or string to kind of tie it together. It's up to you how you want to do it, but definitely possible too. Uh, some good varieties, Fremont. Um, Skywalker has a really nice snowy color. Skywalker is good for a, a fall production. It's a little bit shorter time to maturity. Graffiti has a purple head. You won't need to Blanching is the term for that covering up that I mentioned. You won't need to blanch for the purple ones either, or the Veronica, this Romanesco type. It's very beautiful. Kale is another great uh, crop, um, although it does tend to have a have a common vegetable garden pest, the aphid, that is well attracted to it. I do know some folks who will use kale as a little bit of a trap crop in their garden, or they'll plant several varieties of kale, hoping that one will be much more toothsome to the aphids overall. So there's different ways that you can manage it. Kale is a really good shoulder season crop, so you could have planted it already in your garden, um, particularly in the fall, though you can, you can plant in July for a fall crop and so it will often last through several, several frosts, particularly if you're able to offer some, some freeze, some cold protection in the way, in the form of covers or something like that. Um, there are some really great varieties that do well here. Lacinato or the dinosaur kale, this one on the left. Um, Red Russian is this really lovely one. This is, I see particularly in salad, mixed salads when it's very young or microgreen mixes, that kind of thing but very nice, even larger when you let it get to a more mature size and harvest it for stir fries and that kind of thing. Cabbage uh, is one that you can start indoors and transplant two to three weeks before last frost. So we still got a few weeks to go before they really need to start going out. Um, these, this is one to keep an eye out for cabbage loopers. Cabbage loopers are those little green inchworms that you see um, on, on the plant, the adult form is the little white butterfly that you see fl flitting around a vegetable garden. Pretty easy to manage if you wanna put like a row cover over them to prevent the adults from laying eggs on the, on the plant. Um, or you can hand pick if you would like to as well. A couple good varieties for this one, Gonzalez has little mini heads, uh, six inches in diameter. So it's kind of a single serving, only 55 days to maturity. These guys are quick. Um, Caraflex has this unique kind of teardrop shape 
also kind of a single serving size. Don't know many people who are interested in the massive cabbages for storage, um, but if you email me, I can send you uh, some, some good options for big ones if, you're, if you make a bunch of sauerkraut or something like that. But most people kind of want them for stir fries or fresh for their tacos in the summer or something like that. And these little minis are really nice for that. Okay, leafy vegetables, um, our lettuces and our spinaches. This is also getting into a really good time. Next week, we've got a little bit of cold in the forecast. So maybe wait until next weekend or get things a little bit of a head start by germinating them inside this weekend if you've got some time on your hands. Um, lettuce, I, I'm gonna be a brokered record on this one, but lettuce really likes rich soil. Um, so amend with organic matter, try and get your organic material in your vegetable garden. As a general rule of thumb, somewhere between three to 5% organic material for, for most of our vegetable crops is an ideal range. Higher than that, you start to get other problems that I don't have time to get into, but um, three to 5% is your ideal range. Uh, and good drainage. You don't want the soil to be holding onto water for, for hours and hours. You want it to drain out fairly well. Lettuce is another crop that has, lettuce and spinach both have fairly shallow root systems that don't compete very well. So mulching, um, not shown in this picture, unfortunately, they went more with a dense planting to manage moisture and weed issues, but you can definitely mulch your lettuces in to help with redu weed reduction, help keep the soil cooler so you get a crop for longer into the season and help reduce um, water loss. They do germinate fairly warm, 60 degrees. So this is another one you can definitely start in the soil, but they're not going to germinate very well until those soil temperatures warm up, or you can germinate them inside um, a few week, a week or two before you want to transplant them out. Lettuce sprouts really quickly and it, it transplants quite well. Um, so you can go either way with lettuce, depending on what your preferences are and how you manage your garden. And lettuce can be fertilized when you plant it. Um, and then about two weeks later and kind of a one or two more times maybe until they start to bolt later in the season. Bolting is when the lettuce actually changes into its flowering form. The taste usually becomes very bitter. The sap becomes milky instead of clear. And they're just, they, they're no longer very good for, for eating. If you're not needing the garden space, that's a good time to let them go and let them actually flower. Um, that way you can harvest some, some seed if you want to save seed, or you can let those flowers benefit some of the pollinators in your garden as well. There's a bunch of different types of lettuce. Um, butterheads are the small, those that are small with loose heads, they have soft leaves. Um, I really love the butterheads. The Batavians have a little bit thicker leaves. They do form heads. Romaine are more upright. They have an elongated head as they grow. And then loose leaf have kind of a crisp leaf along a stalk. And often you can plant them fairly densely so you don't actually see much heading up. And then crisp head, I won't really talk about. It's like, an, like the iceberg lettuces. They're not very suited to our hot areas. So I won't, I won't get into the details on those. Our butterheads, uh, some great varieties of butterheads that you can get here. Tom Thumb, they're little like mini salad sized heads once they're mature. Uh, individual salads, they're great. Butter crunch is another one. Merveille de Quatre Saisons is a great, um, all, it kind of works really well if you succession plant. I didn't mention that yet, but succession planting is a really nice way to manage that lettuces. You can plant like every two to three weeks, plant some new lettuce so that once you've harvested, you've got a new crop coming on. Um, summer bib is another really good variety of these butter heads. Batavians are nice because they're more resistant to bolting. There's two varieties that CSU has trialed, Nevada and Sierra, and they both were fairly resistant. So they're good for a little bit later into the growing season. Leaf lettuces, um, these are more likely to be in your lettuce mixes. If you get kind of a, a, a salad greens mix from a nursery or from a seed company, Red sails, Simpson Elite, Bronze Arrow, often oak, an, oak leaf, an oak leaf style. Um, New Red Fire is a great one. Simpson Elite, um, any, of, any of the lettuces with Simpson in their name are all very, very nice lettuces. So that really, with lettuce, as long as you're not trying to, to get them to mature in the peak heat of summer, 
the world's your oyster. There's very, and you're growing these, these variety, these types that I've mentioned. You're, you're pretty good with most of the ones that you can find. Romaine is going to have a little bit more trouble in our heat, um, but there are some that do well, particularly planted early. The Rouge de Vey, shown here, kind of a reddish. Um, they don't bolt very quickly, so it's a nice choice. If you want that standard green, Jericho, uh, some pretty nice choices. Moving on a little bit to the spinach. Spinach is a fairly fast growing, short-lived plant. Um, so succession planting with spinach is important, really important for spinach to give it consistent moisture and actually kind of tamp the soil down just a little bit around the seeds. So you get good soil to seed contact. That will help ensure you get better germination. Melody, America, Bloomsdale are all good varieties to try for that one. There are also some spinach mimics um, that do well in the heat of summer. These both like, like hot temperatures. They're not true spinach, but they can, you can use them as spinach in your recipes. The Malabar spinach is a vine and it does need consistent water to prevent it from flowering, but it can grow in part shade or full sun. Um, New Zealand spinach has short runners. It can tolerate warmth longer, so it can produce for you for most of the season. Okay, onions. I've done a lot of work with onions in Adams County. We did a onion variety, research variety trial for many years and I played around with a lot of onions in a field. Um, but alliums include onions, garlic, leeks, scallions, and shallots. So lots of different things. Onions do have a very inefficient root system. If you look at the size of the plant, this bulb, and then this right here is its entire root system. So you do need to keep that in mind when you're, when you're planting and you're managing your onion crop. They do need a well-drained and rich soil. They do need a lot of nitrogen. They, you, um, they thrive if you can give them a light feed every two weeks while they're growing until that bulb is really just about at maturity. When you're thinking about how to purchase your onions, you can purchase them in oh, uh, several different ways. You can purchase them as seeds. Um, seeds do really well here in Colorado. We're, a bit past the, we're, we're past the prime point for planting seed. Um, really back in March was the time to do that. So now you'd kind of, you're kind of looking at sets or transplants. Sets are those small bulbs that usually you find in a mesh bag. Transplants are usually seeding onions that are sold in bundles, sometimes in trays like this. Um, and you can go either way. It's not really vitally important whichever one you choose. You do want to buy long day types, not short day types. The reason being we live in Colorado and we grow our onions in the summertime when our days are long, uh, as opposed to in like the south where they grow their onions in the wintertime when days are short. If you plant a short day variety here, it's going to grow, a, it's going to mature very quickly and not get very large. And buy the type that you really want to use. Reds are good for fresh eating. They don't store very well. Whites have a little bit kind of an intermediate storage and yellow are going to give you the longest storage capabilities. You know you can harvest your onions when they have started to lodge, which means that the, they actually get a little crease and the whole green part tips over. Uh, you can kind of cut the roots of the soil and pull those onions right out and then air dry them in the shade. And then you can store them as long as the, the type is capable of storing. Okay. I need to speed up a little bit. <laughs> I feel like I'm going so fast, but um, peas are yet another of my favorite crop. They're, we're just about past, at least here along the front range, our prime period of pea planting, um, but you could probably squeak it in if you really wanted to this weekend. Peas are another one. They like that well-drained, rich soil. They're not a very heavy feeder. They're also a legume, so they're able to fix their own nitrogen but they usually have very rapid spring growth. Usually by early July, they're pretty much done for, done for the count. Um, if we have a cold, a cold season, then maybe you can eke it into mid-July, but maybe you'll be replanting in mid-July for a fall harvest. Soil temperatures can be pretty low for these guys, as low as 40 degrees, um, but the earlier you plant them, the better yield you'll get. They're photoperiod sensitive, which means the longer the day gets, the less productive they become. So if you can plant on April 1st, um, you're going to get a better result than if you plant on May 1st, as an example. There's three different types of, of peas. The English pea, uh, your standard shelling pea, your edible pod sugar or snow pea. These you pick before that pea has swollen up. 
and then the snap pea, which you eat both the, the, the pod and the fruit, and the fruit has swollen up. For our English peas, there's some excellent choices. Uh, Green Arrow and Maestro are two that I've grown a lot. I've also grown Tom Thumb, it's lovely. Little Marvel is a good bush type. Um, Alaska is good if you're looking for a lot of, for a pea that you wanna dry and use in soups and that kind of thing. Um, the edible pods, you can go for dwarf gray sugar or Oregon sugar pod, snap peas, Amish uh, sugar snap, super sugar snap. Uh, you can tell what they're going for those plant, those plant breeders they really want to go, to find that sweetest possible thing. Um, and any of these varieties you can definitely plant again for a full harvest. You just want to count back from when our general last frost or first frost date in the fall is and make sure you have time to get a crop in. So look at the days to maturity on your seed packet. Potatoes. Potatoes were, were knocking on the door of being the right time for planting our potatoes this year. They do like a well-drained rich soil, but it you should avoid having fresh manure or fresh compost in um, for your potato beds. If, ideally, if you can get your manure or compost in in the fall before you plant your potatoes, that, that's, that's going to be the most ideal. Um, otherwise, you can get scabby um, skin on your potatoes. Generally speaking, you want to plant your, your potato pieces in a, with a one and a half inch to two inch seed piece. So that means a potato this size, you could actually cut into several pieces. This little guy right here is, is what we call an eye. And you want usually two to three eyes per piece of potato. And you want your soil temperatures to be 50 degrees and up before you start planting your potatoes. So get that soil thermometer out there, start testing. Um, space them 12 to 15 inches uh, apart. Smaller if you're doing fingerlings, larger spacing if you're doing russets. Potatoes are one that we kind of adapt with as they grow. So you'll plant them fairly deep into the soil. And as they, the plant grows up, you can hill over them up to two times. You can use soil. You can also use straw or uh, some kind of mulch. Um, either way, just making sure that you've got all of those tubers completely covered because you don't want any sunlight to get on them. They will start to photosynthesize and turn green and they're not a palatable or tasty crop at that point. Great choices for varieties. Purple Viking, if you like that purple flesh of a potato, making purple mashed potatoes is a great way to please toddlers, let me tell you. Um, Yukon Gold is kind of the, the standard for that creamy, dreamy potato, this one right here. Red Norland is another good one if you like that red skin, white flesh potato. Your main crop, so a little bit longer season, Colorado Rose, this one here, um, absolutely outstanding. Red skin with a creamy uh, flesh. Sangre is a great one for harvesting if you like kind of that fingerling, that small roasting potato. Um, and Kennebec is a good one if you like more that roasting russet type of potato. Longer season, if you can eke it out or if you can extend your season a little bit, my highest recommendation to you is the German Butterball. Uh, it gets taste off winter every year. I've found it at several um, more specialized grocers, but it is a little long for our season. So you'd need to do some season extension or some warm warming of your soil, protecting of your soil to get a reliable crop with, crop, crop, bleh, crop with that one. Um, crackled butterball is a great one too. It's a little bit more dependable than German butterball. Um, if you want just your standard Nicola, it's a good all-purpose potato, or the Rio Grande russet, if you really like that russet type for, for baked potatoes. Harvesting potatoes, you'll usually stop your irrigation a couple weeks before you need to harvest it. Remove those vines before you start to dig. Um, and fairly often you can store your potatoes for almost a year um, under ideal conditions. You want to keep them cool, you want to keep them humid, um, and keep them very much out of the sunlight. The other thing that a lot of folks don't think about if they're storing food from, from vegetable gardens, you definitely do not want to store your onions with any of your other crops. Onions emit, um, oh, it just went out of my head. They, they, they can speed the ripening and um, they, they can speed up or make it so that your other crops don't last as long in storage. So store your onions somewhere separate. 
ethylene. Thank you. Yes, they emit ethylene. <laughs> um, one of my, one, I got help in the background. Um, okay, so moving on to root crops. Uh, root crops do excellently in Colorado. Uh, they're a great choice. Another cool season crop, so we'll be a good time to start planting them in the next few weeks, um, up to a month from now. Um, also a good choice for succession planting. Most people don't want to have a harvest of three rows of beets all at once. If you plant one row every week or every week, one to three weeks, then you can have harvests as you go along through the season. They also like well-drained soil with a high organic material. They do require even soil moisture as you're irrigating. So radishes, the Masato rose radish, it was actually produced at the CSU research farm. So that's a great choice, but radishes have such a short season um, that really you can get away with growing any radishes here, as long as you keep that moisture high. Um, if you like it hot, then reduce your moisture a little bit. Uh, you can also cook them. I learned from one of my master gardeners that if you cook them, that will break the heat a little bit. I don't know. I've never, I've never thought of cooking radishes, so I'll, I might try it this year, but I haven't in the past. But they can vary in variety, size, shape, etc. Carrots are another great choice for Colorado. Getting them to germinate can be a little bit, um, a little bit tricky. Uh, you want to make sure that you've got good moisture and that your soil doesn't doesn't dry out and get that kind of crusty layer. Carrot seeds are very small, and so the germinating seedling doesn't have the oomph to get through that, that crusty layer. So I know folks who put a thin layer of sand over the top, very thin layer, or a piece of burlap or a very light layer of mulch to help keep that moisture level high and help reduce the chances of that crust forming. Uh, the shorter root types are going to be better but Nantes and Chantenay are two very, very excellent um, options if you're looking for a specific variety. And you can mulch your carrots and pull them through um, early winter. They're, they're a good root crop for sticking in the ground. I actually found one that I missed from last year and we harvested it out three weeks ago when we were put, or two weeks ago when we were putting our peas in, into our garden. So, and it still tasted okay. Uh, the top was a little bit, a little bit burned, but the, the lower part was still very, very tasty. Root crops, are, beets um, are another great choice. I love, I love beets so much. Um, I know some, some folks taste the, the muddiness in them or the dirt flavor. If that's the case, you can go, I forgot to add it in here. You can put, you can try avalanche, which is a white variety. Um, but the, if you want golden beets, the golden chiogia is this one with these wonderful um, bullseye kind of look. Uh, if you like just that standard red, um, bull's blood or Detroit dark are good ones. And a couple that I meant to add into here. Uh, beets you can usually harvest at about two inches. Um, if you get if you let them get really big, then they're more likely to get pithy or woody and not be as tasty. Um, and definitely clip those tops before you refrigerate them. Beet tops can be excellent. Uh, really nice to stir fry. Really nice addition to salads if you if you pick them really young. And one thing to note when you're planting beets. The beet seed is a fairly large seed, and that's because there's several seeds within each seed. So no matter how carefully you space out your beets, you're going to have to thin those beets. You'll have to be brutal, and it's a hard thing for many of us gardeners because we love watching things grow. But if they don't have the right space to grow, then they're not going to grow into a beet itself. But those those little leaflet or those little ones that you pull out throw them into a stir fry, throw them into a salad. It's a great way to use them while still giving their, their fellows a chance to grow up to maturity. Turnips are another great choice. Uh, there are some good fresh eating turnips. They're really good in stir fries too. Um, the purple top white is kind of your standard. If you want one that you can slice thinly and put into Asian stir fries or, or other like I've, I knew someone who did them in, in, with their scrambled eggs in the morning. Um, Harry, oh, slaughter the pronunciation, I'm sorry. Hakure, Japanese white um, is a lovely option for that, that fresher type. These ones are definitely cool weather plants. They don't like the heat um, and they 
plant fairly shallow. They have, they do have that root, but they don't, they are a pretty shallow, shallow seed, small seed, that's the word. Okay, I am getting low on time. Um, solanaceous crops, these are our tomatoes and our eggplants, our peppers, um, the thing that you're all here for, I'm sure. Um, tomato, so these guys all prefer full sun. They like well-drained fertile soil that's been well amended. Ideally, they like pH between from six to seven and a half, but sometimes you can nudge it up a little higher if you have to. Um, they do get very grumpy if you transplant them before the soils have warmed. Uh, during the pandemic, my coworker Eric Hammond and I actually did an experiment with this. And on his property, we planted a tomato in soil temperatures. I think it was about 45 degrees. Um, the, the air temperatures were lovely and warm, but the soils just hadn't caught up. And then two weeks later, once the soils had reached 50, um, 50, 60 degrees, we planted another one. That one we planted in cold soil never really caught up for the whole season. So be patient with these guys. You can warm the soil. You can use wall of water. You can use black plastic. You can use season extension, that kind of thing. But really patience is going to be a virtue on these guys. You want daytime temperatures to be above 65 degrees um, or 60 to 65 degrees and soil temperatures in the same range. Okay, I'm gonna go into peppers first and then I'll get back to tomatoes for you. Sweet peppers, we've got lots of choices. Uh, the big thing to note for some of our, if you really want those, those big bell peppers, they're going to take a long time and you won't get as all that many fruit per plant. So you'll need to plant quite a few if you really want a lot to eat. The more like the lipstick or the, the, the snacking bell pep bells, are going to give you better, a lot more production over the course of the season. Ace and Yankee Bell are both good types. Um, Jingle Bells is a nice petite, and Lipstick is has one that I've grown is very nice and very a very nice sweet potato, sweet pepper. Sorry. If spice is more the name of your game, Moscow is a CSU developed variety um, that is hot. It's also fun to grow because it grows straight up on the plant. Um, if you want to go more standard, serrano or jalapenos, do they grow great here. Um, if you really wanna get that super hot, super chili or Thai dragon are gonna get you into that very, very hot range. Um, and if you like cayennes, ring of fire or super cayenne. And if you're doing more frying or grilling, um, Fry King, Jimmy Nardello, Early Perfect Italian. Um, you can harvest Early Perfect Italian green or you can har harvest it red. A note on, on green peppers is, green peppers are pretty much just red or yellow or orange peppers that haven't matured yet. So you can pick any pepper at green and eat it as green, it's totally fine. Even jalapenos will turn red eventually as they ripen. If you like paprika, sheep's nose is going to be a sweet one. Alma will be more of a spicy one. When you're harvesting your peppers, this is one that's very important that you cut or clip from the plant. Um, they are more likely to get sun scald after, um, after harvest. So pull them out of the sun, get them in, into a fridge, into a cool place as soon as possible. All right, tomatoes. This is the one I know you're all here for. And then hopefully I'll have time for some, some of our vine crops as well. Cherry tomatoes, these are our smallest ones, but Plants can get very large. You can get little dwarf container cherry tomatoes, but you can also get plants that grow up over six feet tall. One, cherry, one to two cherry tomato plants is usually good for a family. They are pro prolifically productive. Um, lots of uses for cherry tomatoes. Very few of them make them into my house. They tend to get eaten on the vine. Um, good choices here for, for cherries. Sun Gold is one of the standards, um, as is Sweet 100, Super Sweet 100. Um, those are probably the two most common ones you'll find. If you wanna go a little bit more unique, this is another one I'll slot of the pronunciation, but Blanc Copshin um, is an indeterminate large plant with that bright yellow fruit. Green Doctors, if you want to change it up a little bit and don't want a, a, a colorful tomato, you want that green. Or one of my favorites is actually yellow pear. Um, yellow pear is very reliable, actually does, is yellow colored and has a pear shape. If you don't like the, the fleshy goopy part of the tomato, then pear tomatoes can be a pretty good choice because they have a lot more of that solid part, the solid flesh part. Slicers, um, this is going to be your medium-sized tomatoes. 
These are usually are not ready until July unless you've really worked hard to extend your season. Um, lots of uses for these guys, fresh eating salads, soups, stuffed, you can cook them, you can broil them for your breakfast or put them on your sandwich. Some good types for this one, early girl hybrid is going to give you small to medium and it's a nice red fruit. It's indeterminate. Oh, I didn't talk about that. I, took that. I must have taken that slide out. Um, tomatoes also grow, they grow in two different ways. There are determinate tomatoes and there are indeterminate tomatoes. Many of our, our preservation tomatoes, like the paste tomatoes are determinate because you're looking to get one big crop off of them. And a lot of our hybrids are more, are more low, prone to be or determinate. Indeterminates will keep growing through the whole season and keep producing fruit until frost hits. So that's kind of what that means when you're seeing those, those names. Um, if you want something unique and kind of tangy, um, green zebra is a really nice, unique tomato. Or jaune flamme is a golden orange fruit, um, red on the inside, a little bit smaller than some of our other salad slicers, but very nice. The canning and paste tomatoes, these are the ones that I said are more likely to be determinate, although they're indeterminate as well. There are indeterminates as well. They usually have a higher amount of flesh and a little bit less um, of the liquid part, and they're good, good for canning and pasting, obviously. When, as you're prepping to get the crop to, as you know that your, your tomatoes are starting to ripen, you do want to cut back on any of your fertilizer or watering just to kind of give that plant a little bit more stress and signal it to start ripening that fruit a little bit. Good choices for canning and pasting tomatoes. I can't talk about these with a lot of experience. I don't grow them myself, but Amish paste and Roma. Roma is one of the, the classic standards. Golden Mama is another good one if you want to go for that yellow. A yellow pasta sauce is always a kind of a fun thing. Or Principe Borghese. Um, is a very nice one for dried, like sun-dried tomatoes. And then of course our beef steaks. Our beef steaks are, are the, the princesses of our garden. They sometimes can be a little bit more finicky, but the reward is definitely worth it. They can get really big. Usually the plants are indeterminate and may take a long time to mature. You can pick these green, um, but they do taste better if you can let them mature on the vine. Um, good variety choices here. Brandywine is the, the standard. Gold medal um, kind of looks like a brandywine, but yellow. There's also a yellow brandywine. Um, Cherokee purple, I don't have the picture of, but it's a lovely blushy, streaky fruit, very large, usually has a little bit of green on the shoulders. Beef master, if you want to go with just a very standard traditional beefsteak type. Uh, if you want a green one, Aunt Ruby's German green is a great one with that a lot of the green ones are kind of more of a tangy, depending on what kind of, if you're looking, what kind of flavor profiles you're looking for. Okay. Looks like not any major questions coming in on tomatoes, but um, hopefully I can blast through a few more of these slides and maybe have a couple minutes for questions. Our vine crops, um, broken record again, they like to be, have well-drained rich soil. These guys aren't as heavy of a feeder as you might think for their size. They do still need fertilizer and nutrients in the soil for sure, but they do also benefit from some kind of mulch around them. You can use a straw, um, you can use a dra glass, gla grass clippings. Um, black plastic is one that is commonly used for these particularly because they like their feet really, really warm in the, in the soils. They do need to be in the full in full sun. Um, they don't tolerate cool breezes or wind, and they do generally need really um, a lot of space to ramble in. Um, you can let them ramble vertically. I've seen a lot of people with success with like hog wire fencing and that kind of thing, um, putting their their vine crops up on those if you're limited on space. Generally speaking, for our vine crops, you want to plant them when temp daytime temperatures are around 55 degrees and soil temperatures are definitely over 70. Um, cucumbers, you can go down to 65, but over 70 for the rest of them. They like to germinate warm. Uh, you can either, or they do well when they're direct seeded, um, but you can plant them as transplants if you are very careful to have your, your transplants be quite small, no more than two to three true leaves. 
they get much bigger than that, they're not going to transplant well. They don't like their roots to be disturbed. Cucumbers are going to be one of the easier or earlier ones that you can plant on this. They are rapidly productive, sometimes in less than two months. Um, generally speaking, if your soil temperatures are 60 to 65 degrees, you can put these guys in. Bush Champion is an industry classic. True Lemon is one of those good lemon types. I really love Dragon's Egg. Um, it's, it's a fun one and doesn't bitter even as it gets overripe. Usually you can scoop out the seeds because they get a little bit unpleasant to eat, but still perfectly edible. Um, Corinto is one that has mostly female flowers, so it's easy to get good production. Melons. Uh, melons do grow very well here. Uh, nice list here, but really at most of the ones, as long as you can reach the day length, um, a lot of the melons in seed catalogs you'll be able to get. Eden's Jan is a nice musk melon we, do, we can get here. The honey orange is a honeydew type. Um, and moon and stars. Um, I always have folks who are interested in growing watermelons. It's a smaller watermelon. It will mature more quickly. And so we will probably, you can probably get a finished crop in here along the front range at least. If you're looking at pumpkins, um, pumpkins for eating, winter luxury or New England pie are both going to be good choices. Uh, if you're looking for fun, kakai or rouge, rouge vista tom, um, knucklehead. Um, naked bear is another one that I forgot to add in. Um, naked bear is nice because it, it kind of looks like this kakai. Um, but it has naked seed inside. So you can carve it if you want a unique jack-o'-lantern, but you can also pull out those seeds and roast them and they're naked. They, they don't have that seed coat on them. So you don't have to do any prep. You don't have to crack them to get to this, the, the seed or anything like that. It's pretty, pretty fun. Squash, summer squash, um, cocazelle is that kind of your standard Italian zucchini. Um, Max is gold, if you like that yellow, gives you really good production all summer. You just need to keep it picked. Bush baby, particularly if you're planting in a smaller space or if you're in container gardening, very productive and you can harvest them and they're tasty, very, very small. I've grown, uh, I've grown most of these, but bush baby is one that I come back to again and again. Winter squashes are a great choice here if you find the cucurbita pepos. Um, a lot of the cucurbita moshata um, the butternuts and that kind of, and um, ah, the other one's gone out of my head, sorry, um, are not going to do quite as well because they need a longer season than we can provide. Um, but you can do Waltham butternut or Tahitian. If you're looking for cucurbita pepa, delicata is one of the favorites of, for everybody. It's also fairly good at storing for at least the first half of the winter. Um, Table King Acorn is another good one, or Thelma Sanders Sweet Potato, all great choices for winter squashes. You can always tell it's time to harvest your winter squash um, because the stem starts to brown a little bit. Um, and you, can, you, you usually can't push your thumbnail, your fingernail into the skin any longer once they're ready. You can force this if you know that a frost is coming. Um, with a few, few days notice by actually reducing how much you're watering. Um, or you can actually, you can, you can also pluck blossoms off of the, the plant itself to, uh, to have it focus its energies on the, the plants that are on already growing. You can tell a melon is ripe by either counting the days, usually about a month after the plant flowers, the melons begin to ripen. Um, they should usually be fairly heavy for their size. Musk melons, I love planting musk melons for solely this reason. They slip from their stems. And I'll show you what that is in just in the next slide. But they slip off the stem when they are ripe. So it's, an, it's a guaranteed way to know that they are perfect. In watermelons, their belly will kind of turn a cream or yellow color. So musk melons will slip. And that's what that means. It will actually detach from the stem. OK, I just have this brief little thing and um, I, I work a lot with the, the Grow and Give program if you're not familiar with it. Um, so if you have garden space and you can plant a little bit extra or if you end up having extra every season, we do ask that you, you plant with the intent to donate to 
anybody in need. So it can be friends, family, neighbors. Um, you can definitely donate to food banks. If you're a member of Grow and Give, you can then go on the website, report your donation, and get the good feelings of helping contributing or helping with food insecurity within your own community. 